Well, hello everyone, and thanks for joining us back here on the Noman live stream for our event this evening, Envisioning Insect Vision, the World of Science and Animation. Uh, my name is Adam Hartzell. I'll be your host uh, this evening, and I have the honor of introducing our guest, but before I do, I just wanted to uh, share a couple of things. I'd like to thank Lenovo, uh, powered by NVIDIA, for sponsoring tonight's event. Lenovo helps Noman to continue to bring free educational events to you. Uh, and this live stream will also be added to our stream catalog and be available to watch on our Twitch and our YouTube channels after the event concludes. Our events, including this stream, are available with closed captioning via Facebook Live. Uh, so you can find a link on our Facebook page channel um, in the chat if you would like to utilize that feature as well. Um, so with that said, I would now like to introduce our guest, uh, digital artist Eric Keller. Uh, Eric has 23 years experience in the visual effects industry. His background in creating animation for scientific visualization provided a groundwork for his diverse client roster, as well as his creature modeling work for feature films such as 10 Cloverfield Lane and Star Trek Beyond. Uh, Eric has been a guest lecturer at Harvard Medical School and has authored countless tutorials, video series, and books. His most recent work involves the soon-to-be-released planetarium show Signs of Life at the Samuel uh, Oshlin, uh, or, sorry, Ocean Planetarium at Griffith Observatory. Uh, he also has a species of forward fly named in his honor, uh, whose name I will not attempt to to uh, pronounce wrong, and I'm sure Eric can help us out with that, with that once he gets on the uh, on the stream. So with that, I want to say welcome to the stream, Eric. Uh, it's a pleasure to have you here. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. I'm happy to be here. Um, I've actually mispronounced the name of the, of the fly in question as well <laughs> myself, so I don't feel bad. I mispronounced All right, thank it. Thank you. Um, yeah, so so maybe uh, yeah, tell us tell us a little bit about yourself, and then you could tell us about the fly. Oh, okay. Yeah, we're going to yeah. talk a lot about bugs, probably, <laughs> most likely. Um, yeah. So I've been a CG artist for a very long time. It doesn't feel like way. It feels like it just started yesterday. Um, I did. I have been both a student and a teacher at Noman. Um, Noman has been a big part of my life and a big part of my career, and I love it. Um, it's a great school. I uh, made a lot of good friends in there, a lot of good connections to the school as well. In fact, um, a job working on uh, the Star Trek movie and 10 Cloverfield Lane I got because one of my students graduated from Noman and got a job at Bad Robot, called me up one day and said, hey, we need somebody to make a big monster for this movie. Are you available? And luckily, I just finished project, so I was available. So I got to spend a few months working at Bad Robot, which is a lot of fun. Um, also just kind of just freaky uh, because you would have like, you'd be working on your computer and like celebrities would like walk through and that kind of stuff. And we had really cool parties, but um, we got to do a lot of really cool stuff. It was a fun, fun time. Um, so, I mean, I, my career is a little weird because I started in scientific uh, visualization at the Howard Hughes Medical Institute way back in like 1998. So um, I had actually studied music in school, which is a, a lot of fun, but completely useless unless you want to be a waiter for the rest of your life. Um, I was luckily a terrible, terrible waiter. So that career did not last long. Um, but, you know, after school, I was trying to figure out how to become a musician. And I started to realize that um, one of the big problems was is that I loved practicing my musical instruments and study music but i didn't care for performing like it's not that i had stage fright or anything like that it just it was a big pain in the butt and i didn't really enjoy it mm. so a light bulb went off my head and i realized maybe what i really like to do is work on solving puzzles and making things in isolation <laughs> um and that that kind of personality is much much more well suited for doing cg I was like doing art, I was like science, so I managed to fumble my way into doing 3D and I landed a very nice uh, temp job at Howard Hughes Medical Institute, so that was right, 90, 1998. Mm -hmm. So uh, they had a lot of money and so they got a SGI machine um, with Maya and they hired me to do scientific animations. So this is Maya version one. Um, and there wasn't a lot of great information on how to learn Maya. It was 
all these giant gray phone books that you had to plow through to learn it. There was only one other decent place to learn Maya, and that was Alex Alvarez, who had just started doing producing the videos, Noman videos. So he was making VHS tapes back then. So ask your grandparents if you don't know what a VHS tape is. Um, and I would, I would watch, you know, I ordered them. I spent all my money on them. I drove my wife crazy talking about them. She's my girlfriend then, but now she's my wife talking about them. And I just, you know, consumed them and they didn't. And, and Alex and Darren had started an on, kind of an online nomen thing as well. And so I was, I was going through that a lot. Um, and I think it was around like 2003, 2004, I started getting into ZBrush. Um, the CG industry of DC, Washington DC, was not great. It was very much a print town. It's a town for lawyers, right? So mm -hmm. there's not much creative stuff going on. Um, and John Brown had released a VHS tape, or maybe he'd switched DVD, I don't know. That, that part doesn't matter. But anyways, I think it was about halfway through watching his first tutorial where I would just stop and I watched it to my wife and it's like, let's move to LA. We're sick of DC, let's get out of here. Move to LA, I wanna study with this guy. Mm -hmm. And so she actually agreed to it, uh, and we moved out to L.A., and I uh, started taking classes. I took classes with um, John Brown. Uh, also, uh, Kevin Llewellyn was teaching drawing back then. I don't know if you've ever seen his drawing, uh, but it's, it's incredible drawing. And so, um, yeah, so I started out taking classes at Noman. I was freelancing at the time, so I was working at places like Prolog and uh, Imaginary Forces and doing a lot of industry stuff, um, sort of more in the motion graphics title sequence kind of thing, which I still do some of that too now. Um, but then my career kind of bounced back and forth between doing entertainment uh, stuff and science stuff. The science stuff is what I love the most, um, but I also enjoy doing the entertainment stuff too, because it's creative. But I like having that flexibility to do a lot of things. So that's kind of what I've been doing. And uh, I have some personal projects. I became obsessed with insects a few years ago, like 10 years ago now. Um, and I still have a strong obsession with it because there's, I just feel like I'm scratching the surface of the topic. So that's kind of where I'm at. And then mm -hmm. I did the planetarium show in 2018. We finished it. It looks awesome. We were about to release it. We had you know, premiere parties planned, rap parties planned, everything. And then you all know what happened. COVID-19 shut everything yeah. down. Yeah. And so we're just waiting for hopefully life to return to normal so we can release the show because it's absolutely amazing. It's fundamental. Uh, actually incredible. And I got to do everything from astronomy to bugs and there's all kinds of stuff in it. Mm. Well, and uh, I guess it's kind of serendipitous tonight that that hasn't been released yet because now we get to let everybody know about it. I mean, there are plenty of people that already knew about it, but um, I'm one of the newbies. So I'm looking forward to seeing that when that comes out. Um, well, so, oh, go ahead. Well, I just want to say it's all about the search for life and there's a lot mm -hmm. of stuff on Mars on it. And the problem with it being delayed is that scientists are discovering stuff about Mars all the time. And I'm like, don't discover anything that's going to make us change the script because <laughs> we already yeah. learned everything. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> And and please no spoilers, JPL or NASA or you know. As if you have had of your life. Nope. Yeah, no, that's fascinating. Um, so and then okay, so getting back to the fly, how does one get a fly named after them? I mean, I, I don't think that I've oh. ever quite heard of that before. Oh, okay. So yes, yeah. so here's the fly in question, Megacelia <laughs> Kellery. Yeah. And um, the story of how I got my uh, fly named after me uh, is probably less glamorous than it sounds, but more interesting. Um, when I when I have a tendency to get interested in a topic, the first thing I do is find the people who know the most about it, and I make friends with them. And I suck information out of their head, much like a mosquito sucking blood out of your <laughs> veins, right? Uh, because this is really important. This is the, the, you know, find the people who have the information and befriend them. And, and so what I did is I went to the Los Angeles Natural History Museum, and I became friends with the entomologist there. So uh, Brian Brown, who's a fly expert, forward fly expert, Natural History Museum in LA, Lisa Gonzalez and Emily Hartop and, and a number of them. And so um, I actually started spending time with them and they had started a project called Bioscan. So what Bioscan was, 
or is, because it's still ongoing, is it's the first ever survey of insect biodiversity in urban settings. No one has ever gone into a city and say, what kind of bugs live here, right? Wow. And yeah. so what they did is they set up malaise traps. So a malaise trap is basically a big tent and it collects flying insects into bottles of alcohol. Um, spoiler alert, the insects die. But what they did is they asked for volunteers around Los Angeles to um, let them use part of their yard. So we let the Los Angeles Natural Muse Museum use our backyard to set up a malaise trap. And so every few weeks, Lisa would come over, collect the bottle, and they'd take it back to the Natural History Museum, sort through all the bugs, and discover what they would see. And they discovered all kinds of surprising things. Uh, through the course of the first bioscan, they discovered some 30 new species, new to science, of forid flies, which are these little teeny weeny itty bitty flies. Um, and as a thank you to the people who participated at Bioscan, they named uh, each species after the families that had. So it's not That's like cool. I was in the jungle doing the hard work. I just rented out part of my yard. But the important lesson here is that this is the kind of reward that you get when you work with, when you become a citizen scientist and you help scientists, right? Um, there's there's perks, like having a fly named after you. <laughs> yeah, absolutely, and it's pretty cool to have like something something in nature, which you know it's gonna be around for quite a while. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm sure the, the the fly will probably be around a lot longer than we will. Um, <laughs> cool story on Ford flies. There's one type of fly called a coffin fly. Now these things are about as big as a pencil lead. They're itty bitty. They're not like house flies. They're very small. But they call the coffin fly because these things seek out remains, and there's actually uh, a specific species that seeks out human remains, and it will dig six feet into the ground and penetrate a coffin and lay its eggs in the de decaying corpse of a human being. And those larvae will emerge and crawl six feet, which would be like crawling, you know, 100 miles for us. So how do these flies know, how do they sense that there is a coffin below them if they're that small? I mean, it's That's it's amazing. absolutely fascinating, but they're used yeah. in forensics. So I just wanted to gross everybody the hell out. Um, yeah, and you kind of laid the groundwork or a pitch for like a sequel to The Fly, I think. Um, <laughs> you know, that, that sounds pretty cool. Um, zombie flies coming up zombie from the grave. Fly. Yeah. Um, okay, so you've one of the things I'm excited about tonight is, you know, See uh, the CG working, working with 3D tools, visualizing things in that manner, um, actually has a lot of really cool cross-disciplinary um, opportunities, right? We're not just talking about films or games or television. We're we're talking about a lot of other things, um, and that's something I'm fascinated with because I get to spend a lot of time talking with aspiring artists about, hey, these are types of opportunities that would be available to you. So you've got something really cool to show us tonight, um, and I'll just kind of. I guess I'll, I'll pass the mic to you at this point and let you kind of set that up and begin showing us and I'll sort of, uh, you know, ride shotgun and uh, ask questions from the chat and, uh, you know, kind of nerd out with you and, and, and raise questions myself too. Yeah, yeah, please do. Feel free to ask questions about anything, uh, um, especially if I go on a long, boring tangent about insect evolution or something. Uh, I don't know, if you're gonna be talking about graves and flies and digging, I don't see how it's gonna be boring, but yeah. I, 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 I yeah, that's the grossest story I'll tell. I will tell it <laughs> the other I think. Um, cool, uh, all right, I need to, how do, are you guys see, see my screen? Can you share, okay, cool. Yep, we got it coming um, through. So I wanted to talk about a project that is kind of a personal project. Um, let me see if I can get my, web browser here. So I have some web pages open. Um, so I started this project a few years ago. It's called Entomology Animated. So this is a personal project. And the idea behind it, since I do CG for fun, I do it on weekends, 24 hours a day, whatever. I wanted to use, see if I could use CG to explore different topics in entomology. So for example, I think the first one I did was uh, on fire and venom. So I created a series of videos, and they're all available on YouTube and also through my website called Entomology Animated. And what I wanted to do is I wanted to answer the question, do fire ants bite or do they sting? And the answer is both, actually. So I created just a goofy little video 
uh, because I am obsessed with ants, uh, and there's there's good reason for that. Um, and so I made these things available online. I'll just play a little bit, but I'm going to turn the volume down here. Just just scroll through here. So I wanted to create basically like a scientific illustration that used you know Hollywood kind of effects to talk about some really interesting topics such as where fire ants came from, the chemistry behind their sting, uh, the actual anatomy, the molecular structure of the venom that they inject, how they inject, and inject the venom, and so on. And then I even have like a little sting going on here showing the, uh, let me see if I'm sorry, I'm bouncing around here. Uh, let's see if I can scroll over there. There's a lot of talking. So this is my first attempt. The only problem with this video is it's like 12 minutes long, which I think is a bit too long for the video for the internet. But I, you know, I just had a little animation that shows it injecting venom into the cells and so on. So that was my first one, and then I did that uh, by myself, but with a lot of help from from entomologists who would help me with the science. And then I did a second one on the bombardier beetle. Uh, this one was a lot of fun. I wanted to explore the chemistry of how they're, they're, you know, they, bombardier beetles shoot out very hot, smelly, caustic liquid out of their butts. And they do this as a defense mechanism. So it's an interesting topic and I wanted to explore it. But one of the things that I did in this particular episode for fun is I was trying to get into learning Unreal. So what I wanted to do is uh, I created a fake video game which I'd love to turn into a real video game at some point. So this is my fake video game. So I took my models, I rigged them, I animated it into Maya, but I brought them all into Unreal and I rendered it in real time. I apologize for the video compression and YouTube is kind of destroying the, the way it looks, but you get the idea. So it's just like goofy little joke video game that kind of draws people into the idea of the intense drama of what it's like to be an insect. Now, I would like to point out in the real world, the bombardier beetles do not shoot flames out of their butts. This is kind of hyperbole just as a joke, you know, it's a gag. So I started there, but then uh, I got into more of chemistry and the biology of how these guys work. So, and then talking, they actually have little re uh, um, reaction chambers in their butts and the reaction chambers actually make a little chemical compound and they use enzymes and they shoot this stuff out of their butts at about 100 degrees Celsius, which is, you know, boiling water. Um, so it was an interesting topic. So I took, I, I, I did that one, I put it up there, it was like 2015. And then I got very interested in insect vision. So my latest um, video series is exploring insect vision. Because as we all know, you know, whenever you see movies, especially old movies, they always show insect vision as being like, a whole bunch of repetitive hexagonal images of mm -hmm. the same thing. That's not how insects see. That doesn't make any sense, right? Why would it be advantageous for an insect to have a thousand versions of the same image? You can't make any sense of it. Really what insect eyes work, how they work, is it's more like a very low resolution computer screen. Each of these, this is the cross section of uh, an, an insect eye and each of these um, is kind of like a pixel on the screen. So I'm working on a series now. My friend Andrew Shower is, is writing it. Um, so he teamed up. And we've, we're starting to figure out a way to make these things down to like three or four minutes, which is much more digestible for the internet. But we're trying to explain how these things work to uh, a, a naive audience. And you can see with, with each version, the models get better, the animation gets better. I'm starting to get a better handle on how best to do this. The problem is, is the insect vision turns out to be an much bigger topic than you might think initially. Because uh, what I'm showing here in this particular animation is how the A position eye of a, of a carpenter ant works, which is a very simple eye, because carpenter ants don't have to see very well to do what they need to do, right? Um, so I'm talking about this and you know cross section and so on. You guys can watch the animation online. We're not gonna go through the whole thing, but it's kind of fun to come up with a challenge like, how do we, you know, how do I get, show the brain inside the ant and all this kind of good stuff. And then the second episode, I talked about fireflies uh, because fireflies have a different problem than ants. They have to be able to see at dusk when light is changing. You're going from a bright daylight into nighttime. So their eyes have to adjust kind of like ours adjust, but their eyes are, are much simpler than ours. 
So I did a comparison between an ant eye, and which is an A position eye, and a firefly eye, which is a super position eye. And the fireflies actually have these pigments that move up and down based on the amount of light that's coming into their eye, right? So that's the that's the abbreviated version of this animation. Um, and then the third group, uh, one, we're talking about honeybees uh, because a lot of insects, we have compound eyes, which are the classic, you see all the, uh, the facets on the side of their eye, but many insects also have what's known as ocelli or ocelli, which is three additional eyes in the top of their head. Some have two, some have one, most have three. And these act more like a way to sense the horizon and that kind of stuff. So we've been, we've been doing this project for fun. And um, I do a lot of stuff where we actually do a deep dive into the Ocelli. And this is always a challenge, trying to create a model that looks good, both from really far away and from extremely close up. Um, it's something that I'm still struggling with, but getting better with each, each uh, uh, variation or each iteration. And uh, yeah, so that's kind of where we're at the project. I'm, I'm working on, or I just started the fourth chapter in this series, which I'll show you kind of a little bit of behind the scenes tonight. So here's like my B model. And in the course of doing these projects, um, yeah, I, I would be happy to talk about the, the pipeline and the tools that I'm using. Um, one of the things that, I, that um, the biggest bottleneck that I have is rendering. So I've experimented with using Unreal, which works pretty well. I'd like to get back into Unreal. I was never quite happy with the realism of my models in Unreal, so I kind of switched back to Maya. Um, I found that uh, I'm starting to use Redshift for Maya, which I absolutely love because it's so fast, it looks so beautiful, and you get results really, really quickly. So I got a new computer with a couple nice GPUs in it, and I'm using Redshift. I've also switched like the, the B, I was just showing you that animation. I was using a lot of paint effects for the hair, I've since switched my workflow over to Yeti. Um, Yeti, I think, is awesome. I I much prefer it to the other uh, hair methods. Um, let me take a look here at uh, you know Yeti has its own interface. So this is part of the plugin, and it has a node-based interface for actually hooking up the hairs. But the other thing I like about it is it works really well with Redshift. You can apply Redshift shader directly to uh, the models, uh, to the hairs, and uh, it looks really awesome. Yeti also works really well with Arnold and a number of other rendering engines I just really like. And I actually I believe there's even Yeti for Unreal now as well. Um, but in terms of the overall pipeline, I generally start, well, the first thing I start with is, of course, research, lots and lots of research. Um, if there's a particular topic I'm interested in, I will find the scientists who are um, experts in that field and will contact them and, and we'll, I'll work out a script. So I work out my, a script with my friend Andrew, uh, Andrew Shower, who's doing a lot of the writing. And then I kind of do a quick storyboard. I'm not much of a storyboard artist, so I kind of do it very quickly. I do, I just kind of skip right into animatics. But then, you know, I build models in ZBrush. ZBrush is the center of my pipeline. So here's my uh, Bombardier uh, Beetle model, the one I was just showing in that animation. And um, I actually have this, you know, broken up into parts, but I even have the interior anatomy. Let's see if I can get down to the parts of the interior anatomy. Down here at the bottom. I look at a lot of illustrations, so yeah, you can see that kind of thing. So I usually start with a ZBrush model and um, build it up. I do a lot of my texturing. I still do poly painting because I really love poly painting in uh, ZBrush, mainly because of the way that, uh, to be honest, the, the things I like about poly painting is the smooth brush is such a great blur brush, right? If you turn off Z add, you turn on RGB, then your smoothing brush does such a fantastic job of blending colors together mm -hmm. that I can get a lot of subtlety in there. I also really like the way that the paint brushes work and because you can use all the ZBrush brushes to, to, to apply the, the paint. The other thing I like about ZBrush is I make all my uh, displacement maps in ZBrush. I usually export as 32-bit EXRs. Um, generally speaking, once I've done a, a sculpt of the model, 
I'll take it into Maya and do a retopology, so I have a nice animation-friendly topology. Um, these days, however, now that ZBrush has added the extrude edge feature to ZModeler, I, now I do my topology in ZBrush. Also, uh, I am a, I am, like many CG artists, I am a topology snob because I spend so much time doing stuff for animation. So I like to keep things quads. Uh, I like to have everything very neat. Um, so for a long time, I didn't use ZRemesher. Now I'm starting to use ZRemesher more and more if it's a part that doesn't necessarily need to be animated or deformed, right? Um, ZRemesher has gotten really, really good. So if it's a static prop or something like that, I'll use it for that kind of thing. Um, so then I, I will uh, I generally do my UV mapping in um, Maya, my retopology in Maya. I'll rig the model in Maya. And uh, I will say that my rigging skills are okay. And this is a thing, a point that I like to, to make to all the people starting out in, in CG. Don't try and be great at everything. Pick three, what I usually tell students is pick three things that are closely related to be good at. And what I mean is, if you love modeling, be a great modeler, but also maybe learn how to texture, including UV map, that's very important. And maybe learn how to render, because that's a great way to show off your models, right? So be really good at those three things, and then pick another couple of skills to be pretty good at. Rigging would be a good choice. I'm a pretty good animator. I'm not going to be blowing away anybody at Pixar or anybody anytime soon, but I can still animate when I need to. And, and then I learned enough about compositing and lighting and all that kind of stuff. So I actually can put together an entire animation by myself um, that is good enough for, for what I needed to do. The other reason this is beneficial is it's not just personal projects, but you know, there's always in the industry, when you're working in the industry, there's always this, um, conflict between becoming a specialist and becoming a generalist. Because if you become a specialist, right, you're going to get really, really good at one thing. Let's say you're really good at grooming human hair. That's a great skill to have. It's in demand, but it's not always in demand. And the problem is, is if you're overly specialized, you might be the, the greatest groomer in the world, but you're only going to get work when they need a really great groomer. Um, if you're a generalist, then that means you get work more often. And it might not be as glamorous. You might not be able to brag and say, hey, I'm the big greatest human sculptor in the world. But the good thing about getting work more often is it puts you in contact with other artists. Um, you learn more things, you start to explore, and that's how you get opportunities. The number one way to get a job in the industry is to make friends with other people in the industry. Um, the old adage that, you know, it's not what you know, it's who you know is very important. And people tend to think of that as sort of cynically, but it actually is just true because it makes sense. If you're running a studio and you have a job coming up and you need artists, the first thing that you do is you go to the artists that you work with and that you trust and you ask them, who do you know that's really good at rigging? Who do you know that's really good at grooming? Whatever. And they'll tell you who's really good. And I've gotten so many jobs. I've gotten jobs and I've given jobs, especially people I know at Noman. Former students have gotten me jobs. I've gotten former students jobs. And it makes sense because if you're working, you know, any production is very intense. There's a lot of money involved. There's a lot of stress involved. Uh, studios, companies, they want to lower that stress level. So they want to make sure that they're hiring people that they trust. And the best thing to do, the way to do that is to ask people that are working there. So apologies for that tangent, but I think it's something really, really important to understand uh, because it's like, you don't need to have everybody in the world love your work. You need to have five or six people love your work and then that that's gonna generate all your jobs. So, okay, so enough of that, blah, blah, blah. Uh, the other thing that I kind of discovered is that, um, you know, I like modeling human characters. I like modeling spaceships, robots, and all that kind of stuff. The problem is, is that there's a lot of people doing that stuff. If you go to ArtStation, the competition for doing that kind of thing is huge. So what I figured out a while back was that I do love science visualization. 
And it also dawned on me one day when I was working on a job that required me to model bugs is there just not that many people doing bugs, right? There's not that many people devoting like all of their time and energy to becoming really, really good at bugs. So if you notice right now, I'm, I'm completely contradicting what I just said a few minutes ago. So I said a few minutes ago, don't specialize, generalize. What I really mean to say is if you're young and starting out, generalize. As you grow in your industry, then start to narrow your skills. Mm -hmm. So don't start out being a specialist, start out being a generalist. And as you accrue these skills and as you discover things about yourself, like allow yourself the time to, to understand what you're good at and what you like to do, then start to specialize. Because what I found is that by emphasizing in insects so much, uh, I've also created a brand for myself. Because I know now that when people say, we've got to model a bug for a job, that there's a very, very good chance that my name is going to be um, tenure, you know, um, among the top 10 or 20 people in the world that's known for modeling bugs, right? So there's a very good chance I'm going to get that job. So it's kind of like a branding, and, and, and I'll show, um, <laughs> it sounds like there's a dog scraping at my door. Um, if I go to, sorry. I'm, While you're setting that up, I've had a few questions come in, if you don't mind me asking them. Uh, yeah, go ahead, because I know I'm starting okay. to ramble here, so please. No, no worries. Um, <laughs> so let's see here. Uh, we've got someone asking sort of like a begin a beginner's question, like what software is best to start with if you're new to uh, computer animation? What would sort of be well, your that's a great, recommendation uh, there? A good question, a tough one. It depends on a few things. It depends on what you like to do, and it depends on your budget. Um, so the good news is now, as opposed to when I started, the software is much cheaper, and some of it's for free. Right. So if you've never touched CG before and you don't have a whole lot of money, then two things, that, three things I would recommend would be number one, Houdini, uh, because there's a free version of Houdini and it's it's loaded with all kinds of stuff. Houdini is especially good if you know you kind of veer towards effects. You like blowing stuff up. You like fluids and that kind of thing. Houdini is a great place to start. If you're uh, more of a generalist animation, uh, then I would say uh, you can start with Blender if you have a tight budget, because um, there's lots of training materials on it. Uh, but obviously Maya is also really good too. Maya, if you're into, um, you like commercial work, then Cinema 4D. So there's not one answer to it. Um, but then of course, uh, ZBrush is my all time favorite. And if you really love modeling, especially if you love characters, uh, there's ZBrush is great. You got ZBrush Core, ZBrush Core Mini. There's subscription to ZBrush, so it's very economical as well. And the other great thing about ZBrush is you don't necessarily need the most powerful computer in the world to run it because it's not necessarily based on your graphics card as much as mm -hmm. CPU, RAM, and hard drive space. So with a decent computer, you can do a lot of cool stuff with ZBrush. Um, yeah, if you can't live without fluids, uh, I think Houdini's. I, I, I've done fluids and I've done dynamics before. Um, I used to be pretty good at it way back in the day, but Houdini's kind of taken over that area of, and I think it's good that Houdini has because it's awesome. Um, I've used the newer fluid tools in Maya. They're pretty cool, but I think Houdini is still, like if you really love fluids and dynamics, just start there, <laughs> you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah. Cool, I don't, any other questions? Yeah, and thank you for that. Um, let's see, another question. Sounds like someone who's, who might be interested in getting into some uh, visualization for the science world. They ask, do you recommend starting in the entertainment industry before starting the science route? Um, and what further education uh, do studios look for, maybe clients look for, for that kind of work when you're doing uh, CG for the science world? Yeah, that's a tough question because um, there is no, there is no pre-planned route. Everything is accidental. Um, the, the, what's in scientific visualization, uh, a large portion of it, there's several aspects to it. You have the pharmaceutical industry that is mainly hiring artists to visualize their research, either for educating patients, educating doctors, or for describing their research to other researchers. So there's a lot of molecular stuff involved in that. Now, that's my dog, sorry. <laughs> um, I want to, uh, I'm gonna do a quick plug here. 
um, for a friend of mine who is a professor at Harvard. He started this uh, website called clarify.com and they have, he's developed a plugin for Maya that's called Molecular Maya, right? So it's a plugin that allows you to bring in molecular data directly into Maya and it actually rigs it up and does a lot of the dynamics for you. It's a really cool plugin and it's worth checking out. But if this is the kind of stuff that you want to do, that's that's a good place to start. Now, the other aspects of scientific visualization, um, there's of course science education. Um, science education, which I've done a fair amount of, I worked on a project for the E.O. Wilson Foundation. So E.O. Wilson is one of the greatest scientists living today. He's the ant guy. Um, and a few years ago, I managed to do a project. He teamed up, his foundation teamed up with Apple Computer, and we did a fully digital textbook for the Apple iPad called Life on Earth. And um, now that was really cool because you're doing science education. The problem with science education is there's not a lot of money in it. And it's a, it's, it's, it's a difficult place because um, where does the money come from and how do you get to those jobs? There's no straight answer for it. You just have to sort of throw your stuff out there and, and see what happens. Again, it's about who you know. Uh, the other aspects of scientific visualization, of course, is that there's illustration and that kind of stuff. It's becoming a bit more 3D and that kind of stuff. The best way, there's one of the things that I did when I was doing, uh, really interested in, in doing scientific visualization, and this is way, way, way back in the uh, early 2000s, is um, I had done, done a number of animations for a scientist named uh, Stuart Shriver through Howard Hughes Medical Institute. But I, I, I was really excited about it, so I wanted to do more. So I actually contacted him and I said, let me just do a science animation for your visualization for free. Um, this is when I was very young and was just starting out in the industry. I don't recommend going out there and doing a lot of stuff for free. It's, it's, a, it's a risk because you're, you're, you're giving away your talents. But if you're really trying to break into the industry and meet people, Sometimes it's not a bad way to do if you can find a scientist that wouldn't be able to afford that animation otherwise. So I did a, an animation for his lab, uh, and that helped me meet other people. It helped me meet um, the people around DigiSign. Again, it's, it's kind of about networking and making connections and that kind of stuff. So I hope that kind of answers the question. You know, if you're passionate about it, make sure that people know that. You know, get an art station portfolio. I mean, I love ArtStation because it's so easy to upload stuff. It's so easy, easy to manage. This is my portfolio. I just throw stuff up there whenever I can. And and I get a, a, a fair number of jobs, both entertainment and scientific visualization, through my ArtStation portfolio, right? Um, so a good example of that is last year after I finished the planetarium job, I bet you guys were worried that I wasn't going to talk very much, right? <laughs> <laughs> no, you're doing great, and this is a this is a great answer to the question, I think. So yeah, so uh, okay, so this is cool because I get to show off some cool bugs too. Um, so let's go to my friend Jackie Lloydies. Okay, so after I finished uh, the planetarium job, it, it ended, and I was back in the freelance world. I got a message through. Somebody contacted me through ArtStation. It was this uh, uh, Australian company. They had seen my work, and they had a huge job where they had to do all of these different Australian bugs and fishes for 3D printing, right, for a museum exhibit. So they hired me to, to do like 30 of these things very quickly. And they gave me scan data, whatever reference they could, and I just had to pump through these models. And I had never done anything significant for 3D printing before, so it was new to me. So I, I did tell them that up front. I was like, guys, I'm not an expert at 3D printing. They said, don't worry about it. We'll guide you through that process. We'll make the models. And so it was a tough job because it was intense and there was a lot to do, but it came out really good. I learned a lot. And then my library of bugs has exploded. So I have a lot of bugs in my hard drive. And so here's, here's an example of one. So this is an actual living organism. This lives in Australia, of course, because everything horrible lives in Australia, except for Australians, they're quite charming. Um, <laughs> but this actual, this is an arachnid and it's named Draculoides bramstokeri, right? Um, which is hysterical. 
That is so and cool. <laughs> so this is one of my favorites to model because it just looks like nature is like fed up with you, wants to give you nightmares. And so they actually just recently posted the um, the finished product online. Let me see if I can find it. I have it a tab here somewhere. La la la. Yeah, they posted it. So this is what the 3D printouts look like. So these are all my models. I mean, this one, this is a blind cockroach. Um, this is this is another view of that one. Uh, this is an isopod. And these are so much fun to model, and so and I can't believe how good they came out because I didn't know what the hell I was doing. <laughs> but <laughs> luckily it worked. And uh, of course I can't see the exhibit until I go to Australia, but it's really, I'm really excited about it. I can't, I mean, cause these things are huge. I didn't realize they're gonna print them so big. This is like a diving beetle. Um, this is a, a pseudo scorpion. So pseudo scorpions are everywhere. They look formidable, but they're actually, they're, they're not dangerous at all. They um, have a, their way of traveling is by hitchhiking. So what they do is they use these pinchers to basically grab on to flying bugs and flying bugs will fly everywhere. And these guys will just hitchhike, hitchhike and let go uh, whenever they need to get where they need to go, which is crazy. Um, <laughs> awesome. But they're really cool. They're not, they don't sting. They don't hurt. In fact, in some cases they might be beneficial. So these, uh, yeah, it's really exciting to see these things in, in a printed form. And, and that's gotten me more interested in 3D printing. And so I'm working with uh, Tomas Wittelsbach. Um, uh, he's teaching me how to do 3D printing. He does a lot of jewelry. Of course, there's a lot of, there's a crossover between bugs and jewelry. So this is something that I just made, which is just, I took one of my beetle models and ZBrush and I decorated it, made it like a piece of jewelry out of it. Um, I'm hoping to 3D print this guy. Um, it's a lot of fun to do. It's a, another one. I so I did a scorpion model. I wanted to do a very realistic scorpion model. So I haven't. I lied about the gross stories. I'm going to tell more gross stories. So this goes to. Um, okay, so night swimming eighty eight just asked, asked a really good question. So I want to circle back on that about scary bugs. So I'll come back to that in a second. So one of the ways that I go about doing uh, reference, if I have to get reference for a bug, and like we all do Google searches, of course, that's one way to get reference. Another reference, of course, my favorite ref type of reference is books. My library is extensive. I read these things. This is a great one for love of insects. Fantastic book, very inspiring. Um, this right here is my favorite book of all time. It is just a textbook, Invertebrate Zoology. This is an older edition. I bought this thing new, so all the wear and tear on it is me just going through here and just the illustrations are fantastic. So I just, I literally just read it. It's a college or graduate level biology book, but I'm not intimidated by that. I like reading this stuff, so I learned about it. So I start there. And like I say, I also make friends with scientists. Friends with scientists. The other thing I do is um, since I got really interested in, in E.O. Wilson's work with ants, and I read a lot of his books. Another example, Superorganism, all about ants, right? Uh, a lot of the photography in this book was done by a guy named Alex Wild. So I found him and I met him. And he and a group of other entomologists have um, a group called Bugshot. And what Bugshot is, is Bugshot is a photography, macro photography workshop. So I didn't know anything about photography. Um, so what I did is I started taking their workshops and they have them, you know, two or three times a year when we're not in the middle of a pandemic. And uh, because of this, this is a picture of us in um, blah, blah, blah. Let me see if I can get that again. Desktop. Okay. So this uh, by right the way, here. I just want to say uh, thanks, Alex, for answering that uh, curriculum-oriented question uh, about cool. the BFA. Appreciate it. <laughs> we got Alex Alvarez uh, watching the stream today and in the chat. All right, no pressure. <laughs> you know, Alex is one of the more handsome people I know. He's very charming too. <laughs> um, it's called pandering. So this is a picture of the bookshop group. And we went to Africa. So this is in Mozambique in Gorongosa Park. And so, you know, on one level, you can get reference from a from a uh, Google image search, 
but you can go to the other extreme where you're actually in the savanna, you know, digging through termite mounds. And when you're doing that, you're learning photography, but you're also some of these are the best scientists in the world. Wow. Peter Nisgrecki, one of my favorites, Thomas Shahan, Nikki Bay, John Abbott. Um, this is me and my wife, Zoe. I dragged her along. She got to see lions, so that's cool. Um, so, you know, it's like the information is out there and it's all about making connections. With, so if you're passionate about something, it doesn't have to be bugs or whatever, make connections with the people who know a lot about it. And that's how you get good at it. And you never know where it will take you. So an interest in doing a realistic ant one year, many years later, ended up with me going to Gorongosa and Mozambique. It was a great trip. And I've also done some other trips with them as well that, you know, uh, and Enzo Borrego, whatever. Um, so back to the scorpion. So uh, in 2018, I did a bug shot where we went to the desert here in California, Enzo Borrego. Um, I had a hotel room, one of those little roadside uh, hotels. And the first morning, you know, after I got there, I took a shower and one of these guys crawled out of the drain right as I was getting into the shower. Awesome. Um, which I think would freak out most people because it's a scorpion. But luckily I had all my bug collecting equipment right there. So I just scooped them up, put them in a test tube and brought them over to the, to the group and we took pictures <laughs> of them. Uh, you know, I, I finished taking my shower and put on some clothes first. Yeah, try, try to do that on Pinterest, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. And so what I did is, uh, so just, I, actually it wasn't, it was just a few months ago. I said, I finally got around to modeling a scorpion. Um, so I modeled in ZBrush and I rigged it up. And this is another one. This is a redshift render. This is all Yeti fur. These guys are a little bit easier because their fur is a bit more uniform. It's not all different colors and that kind of stuff. I, I am going to plug, by the way, um, if you really want to know how I do my workflow, um, you can go to the Noman workshop. And uh, I actually have a video series. Okay. Yeah, I have a video series that goes through my entire workflow in creating a jumping spider from ZBrush all the way to rendering a redshift with Yeti. So um, it's worth checking out if you really want to know the, the gory details of it. Well, you had a few um, questions come in about, about your process and your workflow. So I imagine there's going to be some people out there yeah, heading I'm over to that, to that workshop. I'm going to plug my videos. I have a bunch of videos on the Noman Workshop. I have an intro to Maya. So if you're new to Maya, check out my Maya series. Um, there's other great series from other great artists of Noman as well, including Alex. Um, and then I also have, uh, I have several videos. I have two videos on, uh, one video on spiders and one video on insects. So the spider is kind of my Yeti workflow. The insect one is a bit more in depth, a lot of ZBrush and that kind of stuff, a lot about my approach. So, so check them out. Um, but what I did is I, I modeled this guy, textured him. I was really happy with how he came out. Uh, I did a lot of, this is a lot of Quixel Megascans. These cactuses are all Quixel Megascans. I love Megascans. Um, and then for Valentine's Day, I did like a goofy animation. Let me see if I can find it. Um, and this is so, your shower buddy, right? This is the guy that you, you, that came up out of the drain. Yep. It's the same That's species. That's amazing. It's, the actual species name is uh, Anza Borrego. So uh, it's named after the desert. So then I decided to take it and I made a, uh, I'm getting into making stash boxes. And these days, people like to have fancy boxes to store things in. Mm -hmm. I won't tell you what people are storing in there. That's not my business, but you know. Um, so I want to make these very ornate boxes and I want to print them up and that kind of stuff. So what I did is, you know, on Valentine's Day, I made this stupid animation where I was like, I wanted, you know, made these scorpions form a heart. And I was goofing around with, um, with uh, learning mash, so I did a little animation where these two little scorpions come together and they, they do like a little dance and this kind of stuff. Sorry, the compression is terrible. It's, you know, work so hard at these animations and then YouTube completely compresses the living hell out of them. Um, but anyway, so it just goes to show how you can take an asset and repurpose it, make animations out of it, do 3D printing and that kind of stuff. Well, that totally looks like commercial territory too. I could see. Yeah, I mean, you know, I, I like I've, that being used there. I've done enough commercials. I kind of wanted to do a takeoff of like a typical. Absolutely. Know, uh, what do you call it? A Target commercial or something like that. 
Um, okay, so there was a question uh, I want to get to real quick from Night Swimming 88. Let me scroll down here. Where's the scroll on this thing? Come on. Man. Oh, you know what? I apologize. The the uh, the platform, if that's where you're trying to scroll, yeah. uh, the platform is not prioritized for, for chat. It's just to, so you can see questions are coming in. Um, but uh, maybe my, my colleague uh, can go back and find that question from Night Swimming 88 and send it through to me. Um, or you can open up the chat on the, uh, um, the Twitch stream. Oh, OK. Uh, um, I don't want you to take the time to go do that right now. Well, so the, I believe the question was about real. Ver have I done stuff for movies? Um, yeah, I did. I'm very proud to say that the monster at the end of Ten Cloverfield Lane is mine. Um, spoiler alert: There's a monster at the end of Ten Cloverfield Lane in the movie by now. <laughs> yeah, uh, I think everybody knows. That was a. I, I do want to talk a little bit about that because that was a really cool job, and also coincidentally, it's a great plug for Nomen. So I had uh, was teaching ZBrush at Nomen, and uh, I had a student named Nathaniel Morgan who's extremely talented and an overall wonderful person. Um, he had graduated from Nomen with a certificate. He ended up. He's worked at a lot, done a lot of cool stuff, a lot of great jobs, but he was working at Bad Robot uh, right about the time they finished doing Force Awakens. So he sent me a message saying, hey, we're, we're finishing up a movie. We need somebody to do like a big buggy thing. You're known for your bugs. So again, this is where branding helps. Um, and so yeah, I went in and I interviewed uh, Brandon Fyatt, who was at Bad Robot. I, I've known him through Nomen. So uh, it was an, as, as job interviews go, it was a pretty easy one to get through um, because I knew everybody was interviewing me and they knew me. So I got the job. I got to work on this really cool monster um, uh, on a really cool movie. Uh, it's kind of funny because I saw the end of the movie a thousand times. I didn't even know really what the movie was about until I saw the whole thing. Um, and then while I was there after that, they brought me on to work on Star Trek uh, Beyond. I'm a huge Star Trek fan, so that was a huge honor. I did get to model a little bug for that. I got to model um, the Marauder robots. Those are robots that, uh, that they fight with. It's actually on my demo reel. I might as well just show that real quick. Um, let's see if I can scroll through here. And sorry about the music. Turn it off. Some butterflies. Oh, yeah, some Aquaman stuff. And uh, I've got that question queued up uh, when you're ready. Okay, yeah. So, what was the question again? Okay, yeah. So, here's uh, the Monster of the End, 10 Cloverfield Lane. So, I'm going to do all this kind of good stuff. A lot of these teeth, I stole ideas from ant mandibles and that kind of stuff. Of course, again, the compression has killed it, but it was it was a lot of fun to work on. I did uh, some other things for the movie as well, but that was the main thing. Um, I had done some sculpture character stuff. There's that guy. Is he going to find? What happened to my? Boy, I just I'm just flipping all over the place here. I'm just trying to find the uh, stuff from Star Trek. But anyways, yeah, I got to model some of the. Oh, there we go. So I got to model these robots in Star Trek Beyond. And I, you know, I took some ideas from from bugs and that kind of stuff. And there was there was a little bug in the the movie that's there for like, you know, two and a half seconds um, that I got to do. And I did a lot of this set work as too. So again, generalist is important because I got to model these things as well as the robots, as well as some other things. Um, and you know, and I got to work with Nathaniel. And and then to make a long story even longer. Um, Working at Bad Robot, then I met G. Young, who is my art director on Star Trek, and he became a good friend of mine, and he hired me to work at the Planetarium show. And then I worked on the Planetarium show with at least two or three other people who also worked on Star Trek. So there's a lot of overlap. Um, yes, so now the other half of the question is, do I like creating fake insects or stories or real ones? And that's a really good question. Because when I first started, um, when I first started doing bugs, I did the same thing that every creature person does. They learn a little bit about bugs and say, okay, I know everything I need to know. I'm gonna model some bugs now. So I started modeling bugs. My first five or six bug models that I made up out of the top of my head were terrible. At the time, I thought they were great. Looking back at them now, I'm embarrassed they're awful. Um, but I would come up with these cool sort of stories based on evolution on how I thought the bugs would interact with their environment, right? 
So I'm like, I create like an ecosystem where this bug has an interaction with this plant and they have a symbiotic relationship or whatever. So every time I came up with these stories in my mind and I thought it was clever, I go and read something about a real bug and that story of the real bug would be so much more interesting than anything I could come up with. So a good example is the fig wasp. The fig wasp has a kind of a weird symbiosis with figs, the fig plant. And it was like, it was like nature had totally stolen my idea uh, and improved <laughs> on it. So at that point I realized I kind of threw in the towel and I said, you know what? I'm gonna actually really learn about bugs, not just a few facts, but I'm really gonna do like as deep a dive that I possibly can. That was 10 years ago. I'm still in that deep dive phase. So the short answer to that uh, is now, I actually prefer to do real bugs to made up bugs because real bugs are really, really cool. And there's so much going on in there that, that just barely scratches the surface so we understand. And ants are a good place to start because ants are much, much more interesting than you, you think they are. They're technically a super organism, which means if you are an individual that is made up of trillions of cells, right? And these cells have made an agreement to specialize. You got liver cells, you got brain cells, you got finger cells, eye cells, et cetera, right? Now, if each one of your cell in your body could split off and run around in the environment and then come back, that's what ants are. So hmm. the ant, it's a super organism because it's the ant colony that's the organism, not the individual ants. And when you start to think, learn about that, then you start to realize that evolution is much more interesting and complex. It's not just survival of the fittest. That's just one small aspect of it. There's a lot more going on in there. So yeah, like I really like doing, um, I really like doing realistic insects because I like learning about them and I like meeting the people who know a lot about them. Like uh, Alex Wild, who's a great photographer and John and Kendra Abbott, who do high speed photography and they specialize in dragonflies and so on. And then Peter Nesgrecki, of course, he's also great. Okay. I'm taking notes on all these websites, by the way, because there's some amazing reference to be seen. Yeah, I mean, my, <laughs> places you're going to. My favorite, the smaller majority, is one of my favorites. That's Peter Nesgrecki. He's really interesting because he's not only an amazing photographer, but he's also one of the world's leading naturalists. And he spends mm. his time in Costa Rica and Mozambique, but he's also a professor at Harvard. And I've actually, it's great. I showed him my beetle animation. He told me everything that was wrong with it <laughs> in front of a group of entomologists, but he was very nice about it. But then the next day we went out to basically a small pond in Africa and looked for beetles with a high speed camera. And he told me, we found them and he shot footage and told me, you know, how to get it right. I'm still working on it, of course. Uh, but then, yeah, it's the same thing with, with like Alex Wild and uh, Thomas Shahan. This guy is one of my favorite people in the world. Um, he's probably one of the most famous jumping spider photographers. That's what he specializes in. You've definitely seen his work. He's done a lot of stuff that's appeared in National Geographic. Uh, he's an amazing artist as well. He does both music and traditional mm -hmm. art, woodcut. Uh, annoyingly, he's younger than me. Uh, he's also an amazing scientist. He's a true renaissance man. Um, and I've been out in the field with him and he's taught me a whole bunch about taking pictures, how to take pictures of spiders, how to keep them on your hand while you're taking a picture of them. And the funny thing about him is a lot of his shots, uh, some of the ones that appeared in National Geographic, he took with cameras that he got from uh, uh, garage sales. He literally wow. pieced together these things with duct tape and take pictures that look like this, which just goes to show you it's not it's not always the equipment, you know? Um, so there's a lot of really cool people out there. Um, I know I'm highlighting a lot of male photographers and entomologists, but in reality, uh, entomology is actually uh, probably 50-50. In fact, I think there's more uh, women scientists and artists uh, who are kind of taking over the field, which is cool um, because, you know, it's, it's becoming a much more diverse field. But the great thing about macro photography and insects is you, if you get a camera, all you need is a park or a backyard and you don't have to necessarily go to Africa. There are so many surprising things in your backyard that you don't even know about uh, um, that are just waiting there. I mean, crap, I got a fly named after me that was in my backyard. 
So there you go. Your neighbor. Yeah. Um, oh yeah. Nikki Bay is also one of my absolute favorites. Nikki Bay is fantastic. Um, he walks around with a photography lab on his back and I don't know how he does it. Um, and these guys have workshops and books. I highly recommend checking them out. You know, if that's, if that's your thing. Um, I would say that the, the main thing, you know, I, I'm really into bugs and spiders and that's, that's cool and all, but you know, find the thing that you really, really freaks you out that holds your attention that you can't stop thinking about and find a way to work your CG skills and, 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 and make them meet in the middle. And that's, that's the key to success. And along the way, meet those people that share that interest that you can get information from. So there's there's a question. Question. Sorry. Oh, yeah, go ahead, go ahead. Oh, no, you take the question from the chat first. Um, how long does it take to do a model with rendering? Uh, it's a little bit tough to answer because it, it, it depends. I mean, it's a good question. It depends on what your goal is. So what I tend to think of is in percentage of accuracy. For me to, like, I've been working on this B model, and I'll show you it in ZBrush. We can stop looking at my website. So this B model I've been working on um, since, uh, literally since 2014, and this is an older version of it, right? And I keep improving it every time I come back to it. So that one has taken years. Like, this is an older version, and now I can see all the problems with it. Like, the gaster, the abdomen, this is too tapered. It should look more like a sausage. I posted this online in a bee specialist. Totally tore me to pieces over my antenna. The antenna are all wrong. If you look at bees, their antenna are much more like links of sausages than cups. You know, it's things like that. Like if you take, you know, when I first did a few insects, you know, if you look at the abdomen here and you look at the turgites, right, you see how they have this really kind of beautiful overlapping kind of feature to them, right? Each piece kind of overlaps like this. So when I finally learned that how to do gasters right, I started assuming that all insects that had turgites in their abdomens had the same configuration. So when I model a fly, it would look like an ant abdomen. Then I had a fly specialist, Brian Brown, tell me how I was completely wrong. Um, I think he told me his critique of my fly model is like, you got some parts wrong and other parts really wrong. So, you know, you learn these things. So that's sort of the extreme, like if you're modeling for extreme accuracy, it can take a long time to get, get the model to that point. However, the shorter answer version of that is like, if I need to do like a beetle and I need to get it to 60 to 70% accuracy, it usually would take me like maybe a day to block it out, maybe a day or two to block it out. If I have scan data, then less, and scan data is, is more and more available these days. Um, and then it will probably take me, you know, a couple of days to do the detailing, depending on how correct I want to get it. If I want it to be absolutely perfect, I, you know, I have, you know, a microscope here, all that kind of stuff. I will, I will, I will go to a place like um, an online place, buy some dead insects. Uh, butterflies and things is a good good example of a website where you can order them. They're like three or four bucks, so you can go to a bug fair. Just get a bunch of bugs, dead bugs, and cut them up and look at them under a microscope and see how close you can get them to be right. That obviously takes a lot longer, so that might be like a week. And then there's a process of retopology, UV, texture mapping. I do use Substance now for a lot of my uh, 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 shading and, or sorry, a lot of my texture mapping, that's reduced the, the, the time it takes by a lot. So the time it takes me to bottle a bug gets shorter each time, right? Um, because I know more about it and I have better tools. So now if I, if I really had to do, if I was under the wire and I really had to do a bug quickly, it might take maybe, I don't know, between four days or whatever. Rendering with things like Redshift now, it's like once you set up the shaders and everything, it's so much less time than it used to be. Um, and because I can render now with like subsurface scattering and depth of field and motion blur and what used to take me like hours in mental ray now, you know, 10 minutes a frame or something like that, you know. Um, so does that sort of answer your question? So yeah, it kind of depends on the project. Um, like I say, scan data makes it easier with that. When I had to power through those Australian bugs, I had to, in some cases, I had to do like a couple a day. 
but I didn't have to texture them. I didn't have to, you know, do UV maps because they're for 3D printing. I just had to prepare them for printing, which took a lot of time. Um, there is a question on my ZBrush UI. This UI is actually uh, designed by Tomas Wittelsbach, who does a lot of 3D printing and jewelry stuff. So I'm, I'm, I'm learning his method. He's got a lot of really cool brushes. Um, I want to do a shout out to some cool brushes that are worth checking out. Um, Uh, this is Sky uh, Sakaki. I'm sure I'm pronouncing his name wrong. Um, he has these brushes available. You can get them online. You can send him some money if you want, but he doesn't charge for them. Um, I love his brushes. Absolutely love them. And I have a bunch of them down here. They're the one the SK brushes. They're really, really cool. So they're worth checking out. So I do get some custom brushes. I make my own brushes too. Um, Another question, do you have any other scientific fields that you'd like to make art for? Uh, that's a good question. I do. Since I worked on a planetarium show, I did get to do some uh, astronomy stuff. I can show a little bit. The show's not out yet. So this is a really cool project. So this is, um, I had to make this model uh, of a dwarf planet. Um, and I worked with some former Nomen students on this. Um, and uh, and uh, we actually did a presentation. You can see the presentation is on YouTube for the ZBrush, ZBrush Summit in 2019. We did a little online presentation. But yeah, I got to do this uh, planet here. I textured this in Mari. Um, I did a lot of this stuff uh, with other people. The cool thing about this is uh, it was all rendered in Arnold. Uh, we had to do 8K renders. Right, and the whole thing had to be rendered as a fisheye because it's being projected on a dome. The cool thing about Arnold is uh, it has a fisheye lens built into the software, so you had to get a special plugin to do it. Um, but it was a it's a 35 minute show, 60 frames per second, 8K renders, and that's new compositing render passes. So you can imagine that was a lot of render time. I mean, it was absolutely insane. Um, so I get, did get to do some astronomy. There is some insect stuff in there as well. Um, I have done like human anatomy and that kind of stuff. My, and I've done, uh, I think my other love is um, herpetology. Um, so I've done a, a number of lizards. I did this one recently, which, which I'm, I'm extremely proud of once it loads. This is a Philippine uh, cell fin lizard uh, that I model mm -hmm. and uh, that one, I mean, these things just look insane. They're really, really beautiful animals. So I really like doing lizards. I like doing, um, I'd like to do some snakes. I'd like to do more birds. I've only done like a duck. But I'd like to do more birds. Um, and uh, this is a Galapagos iguana that I did um, a while back. I did go to the Galapagos a few years ago. It's a lot of fun. Places mm -hmm. lousy with iguanas, they're everywhere. Um, Yes, yeah, so hopefully that answers your questions. Yeah, people are really d digging a lot of this other stuff you're showing as well. Uh, they were loving the um, signs of life. Uh, yeah, which that sounds show, amazing. That show is so cool. The funniest thing is, I'm not going to talk. I can't talk about too much. Everything is NDA. But I will say, we learned a lot about the recent uh, Mars landing that we might have to go back and touch up a few things. <laughs> We learned a few new things about Mars. That's great. Um, That's awesome. There was a question about the 8K renderings. I'm going to answer it this way. I didn't have to worry about dealing with the rendering. That was not my job, and thank God for that. But we actually did have a server room completely dedicated to the show that was just basically running around the clock. Um, and they really, you know, they did an amazing job. I mean, and the people who worked on the show, too, I mean, there was a mixture of you know, Don Dixon, who's been doing uh, space art since like the 70s. We also had people who like um, uh, Will Smith, who worked on Marvel films. So we had industry entertainment people from Marvel, Disney, 
all the best movies in combination with scientists. Uh, my friend Esteban Guzman did a lot of amazing concept art and as well, he's an astronomy nerd, a good friend of mine. Um, and he did a lot of concept art as well as animation as, and he did incredible stuff. I'm a little jealous of him because he's younger than me and it was like one of his first big animation jobs and it's like, wow, you started out with a really high bar, man. You got lucky for that one. <laughs> but you know, he'd been working at the planetarium and had an interest in it. You know, it's like, if you have an interest in this stuff, let people know, don't be shy about it. That's, mm. that's, that's, that's how you get the jobs, you know? Um, but it's also another good example of, um, of I got that job because I knew that somebody, G Young knew me and he hired me because he liked working with me. Uh, I think it was um, uh, Neil, Ga Neil Gaiman who gave a speech and he his advice is you had three things, be easy to work with, be reliable and be good at your craft. And in reality, as he says, you actually only need to do two of those. Because people will, if you're good, at, if you have two of those down, people will tolerate if you're not, if you're a pain in the ass to work with, people will still work with you if you're reliable and you're good. If you're easy to work with and you're really good, people will tolerate if you're not super reliable. I always try and hit all three because I like working with good people and I love doing this stuff. I do CG all the time, constantly. And it's what I do in the weekends, you know. Um, so I think that's the best advice I've ever gotten. And just 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 meet meet people and let them know that you love doing it and you love working with them. You know. Uh, cool. Other other questions. I know I'm rambling all over the map here. Well, I was going to ask earlier uh, with some of the the time that you've spent learning from some of these folks that go out and photograph insects and learning to do a bit of that yourself. Did you find that you know literally just getting out there in the world, getting into a physical space with a camera? Um, did that start really uh, helping you with how you were setting up your renders and your camera positioning and that kind of stuff? Uh, yeah, most definitely. I learned a lot about lighting and also composition. Uh, composition is a really great thing to learn with digital photography because you can take a thousand pictures and 999 of them can suck, mm -hmm. right? But you learn about framing the image and the composition and also getting the light. So I actually don't have a lot of my CG work. This is my little, I'm talking to you from my little home studio here. Most of what I have on the walls here is actually my photography. So if I show over here, mm. these are some of the pictures and these are that I took in, in, in Mozambique. Okay, that's that's Alex Wild. I can't take credit for that. But there's, sorry about the glare on that one. You can't really see that one, but that's Scorpion. That's a scorpion in, in Mozambique. Uh, I mean, I, I, to me, he's adorable. I think he's just a goofy little guy and he kind of watches me while I work. All right, I might be a little bit crazy. So I have a lot of pictures and on the back wall here, uh, I'm sorry, you can't really see it because of the glare, but yeah, I, I find the photography, even though I'm not the greatest photographer in the world, is okay, I don't have to be. I find it to be, you know, I learn a lot about the bugs, I learned a lot about how they interact with their environment. The other thing that's important is if you, if all of your reference comes from dead bugs, your models are going to look dead because dead bugs still, they don't look alive. There's a, there's a huge difference. So when you get out there and see them interacting with plants, interacting with other bugs, and you see how they move and how the light interacts with them, the translucency, um, that really helps out a lot. I think that's the best reference you can get. If, if you don't have access to this stuff or you don't have the time to do photography, what I would say the next best thing is uh, if you're if you're getting all your reference online, make sure, don't forget to look at video as well as still images. Because the problem with doing bugs is the still images, you know, a lot of times you'll only see a few views of the bugs. Because most, time, most of the time people are taking pictures, they want to take a nice picture of the bug. And so you'll see the top, but you don't necessarily see the rear like learning how to model this part of the bee is hard to do. Um, let's get another bug in here because, okay, yeah, this bombardier beetle. So like for this model, I actually obtained a, a bombardier beetle, looked at it under a microscope, cut it up, modeled it based on that, looked at images online, but I also looked at video. Probably need to look at some more. Because uh, when you see the, mod, the bugs moving around, you can see how their parts move and interact with each other. There's so many things to discover if we're just talking about basic forms in bugs. 
as opposed to just the whole thing. These things are just, you know, all right, let's see if we can find a more interesting part of this guy. So let's take a look at, oh yeah, here's a good one. So this is a dung beetle. Give it a second here. Okay, this is Phineas Vindex, which is a really cool type of dung beetle. And I mean, the individual parts look like sculpture, right? If we take a look, all right, not that one. Got to find a good part. The thorax, here's a good example. So just looking at these forms are just, they're beautiful puzzles to work out in your brain. How these things fit together, the details, the different qualities on the surface of the bug. Like for instance, one of the things I really like about this is it's not just like one type of detail that covers the whole bug. Here on this, which is the pronotum, right? So this is the head. You see this kind of like this type of detail right here. So I think it's a lot of fun to sit there and try and figure out how do we recreate that with a ZBrush brush. So you have to sit there and kind of noodle with the brush and experiment a little different places and see what's actually working. But then you get back here to the elytra and it's a very different type of detail. And the details kind of follow rules and the rules change from one bug to the other. It's kind of like trying to capture the essence of a personality of a likeness, right? So what I mean by that when I talk about rules is if you look on the legs, okay, so there's this type of pitting here, right? Then on the legs that the there are they're spaced a certain amount apart. We have this kind of detail right here. Um, if we look at on the pronotum, we don't have that type of pitting. Instead, we have like these little overlapping sausage shapes, right? That tend to be a certain amount of length and they lay together in a certain way. And that is what sort of creates that, that type of texture. Now, what's really cool about this particular bug is that it is one of these um, incredibly, sorry, it's an incredibly iridescent insect, like many insects tend to be. There we go. So this one was actually rendered um, in octane. So I was a big octane fan. Now I'm a little bit more on this redshift side. Um, but there's this, it's really this, so I did a lot of this texturing in substance and I took advantage of PBR rendering. So I'm using a lot of metallicity. So I'm painting these colors and that uh, metallic channel is converting that color into the specular colors in the surface. And this mimics the iridescent quality of the bugs. Now the iridescent quality of the bugs is actually much more interesting because what causes this type of reflectivity is that as their exoskeleton grows, they're basically, their exoskeleton is layers of chitin. Chitin is kind of similar to your fingernail material, but different, I mean, in terms of it's an organic substance, right? Um, but the way that it's layered is there's a 3D structure that creates kind of a corkscrew layer. And what happens is wavelengths of light hits these layers and it's refracted back into the environment in different directions, which creates this type of reflective quality. So you have some be some beetles that look like mirrors. They're like solid gold. Some of them have variations in colors and that kind of stuff. And so I'm learning about this uh, more and more. And this is something that I kind of want to explore more in 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 uh, some of my entomology stuff. Um, and I actually am working with this a scientist at LSU who's an expert in the field, and she's she's sort of helping me out. I think in the render here you can actually see a little bit more about that detail that I'm talking about. So. You know, that ZBrush model, I took advantage, you know, I baked out a lot of maps, brought those maps, you know, I uh, did my high poly version, my low poly version, brought them into substance, baked out a lot of maps, and then used that to create kind of these details. So looking at where the surface is very shiny versus where it's very rough, looking at the horn here, and this kind of fine type of detail, this is a very different detail than this type of detail. So, you know, and these, these, these details have different 
they have different ways of giving the bugs an advantage to adapt to its environment. So uh, a really classic example of that is um, anybody who's seen Planet Earth 2, there's a whole section on deserts. They talk about the Namibian desert beetle. Yeah, I actually have made a model of it, but it's not finished. But what's really cool about it is there's these bumps all over the elytra, which covers the uh, covers the abdomen or the wings. It's, this is the elytra on a beetle. Um, and they have these big lumps. And then they have valleys between the lumps. And the lumps are hydrophilic, meaning that they attract water. And the valleys are hydrophobic, meaning that they repel water. So what happens is as the beetle comes out in the morning and stands in a sand dune and the fog rolls in, right? The water condenses on its back and then it kind of has these channels that funnels the water to its mouth. So the point being is that a lot of these details, in addition to looking very pretty or attractive, actually give the uh, insect or the organism a way to uh, adapt to its environment better. I'm, I'm using is I'm struggling to use the most evolutionarily neutral terms that I can. <laughs> This is really fascinating, by the way. I had no idea. Um, another good example is the pitting on a lot of ants. Um, so is this my ant? Is this my carpenter ant? Yeah, my carpenter ant. I mean, these these carpenter ants are beautiful. I, I, I did not get a chance to work on Ant-Man. Um, that's Marvel's fault, not mine. The missed opportunity on their part. But uh, both Ant-Man movies are great. I love them. I mean, I can nitpick about a few things that they got wrong, but they're really, they're nitpicky things. You know what I mean? Um, one of the, the things that I really loved about Ant-Man, um, and I actually started this model before before the movie came out, so this is an older model. But the, at the end of the first Ant-Man, there's a scene where Cassie has a, carpenter, a giant carpenter ant under the table, and she's feeding him table scraps like a dog. And I love the fact that they choose they chose Campanotis to be her pet. The Campanotis, the carpenter ant, has chubby cheeks. They're not literally cheeks, but you see how there's a little bit of chub here? And it gives the insect a really cute kind of quality to it. So whoever made that decision on Ant-Man, it was a good decision. I think I, I, I really applaud the fact that they did that. My main quibble with the first movie is that the ants weren't hairy enough, but they fixed it in the second movie. Um, ants are definitely very hairy because the hairs trap uh, chemicals like pheromones, com uh, chemical compounds in the environment. So the ant is basically one big nose. Ants are more sensitive to chemicals than they are to vision. So an ant's eye is not very powerful. It's only got a, you know, maybe a few thousand omatidia. So it's a very low resolution image, but they're extremely sensitive to smell because that's how they communicate. So if you see ants, you know, the next time you're looking at ants crawling along in a line, you know, watch them closely. What you'll see, because you often see them going in two directions, right? So the ants going to get the food, ants coming back to bring the food to the colony, right? And as they pass each other, a lot of times you'll see it's like a split, seek, uh, a, a split second. One ant will come and rub its antenna on the abdomen of another ant. So what the ant is doing is it's making sure that the two ants are from the same nest, right? So it's rubbing its antenna across the gaster and picking up the chemical signals. And the signal it's looking for is like, hey, are you, are you a one of us or are you one of them? Uh, if you're one of us, that's great, carry on. If you're one of them, then it's time to do battle because ants actually have wars. Nests will go to war with each other. So, sorry, I'm going off on one of these weird tangents again. Um, for those who are interested, there's a great video uh, on YouTube. It's a Nova episode. The entire episode is on YouTube. It's called Ants, Nature's Secret Power. Um, it's a great one to watch. One of the reasons I love it is because it's got the weird, creepy music that you used to hear in the high school biology films. Um, but it's a really, really cool movie, and they talk a lot about this kind of stuff and and just the amazing science of super, super... Um, super organisms. So the question is, can you earn a good living working as a model or animator for scientists? Uh, well, if you could, then I wouldn't be doing entertainment shows. <laughs> um, 
it's tough because it's just like entertainment. The market goes up and down, different things go in and out of vogue. Be, entomology is not a big money-making field. Right now, if you were a specialist in viruses, yeah, you'd be doing well because viruses are big right now and there's a strong incentive to find vaccines. Might not have been as true maybe 10 years ago. Uh, cancer research is always a big, big field. Um, if you want to do a lot of uh, pharmacological animations, then yeah, but it still it tends to be a bit more like the freelance market. It's more similar to the entertainment industry than you might think. So what you have to learn how to do is piece together a career from working at various different scientific jobs. Obviously, you can do it. I mean, I've done it. Uh, I have a house. I live in Los Angeles, and I'm able to have a good living. Uh, but of course, I also have a wife who earns money as well. Um, but yeah, it, it takes some time. But if you keep doing it and keep making the connections, what you do, what happens is you start out doing whatever you can to make a living as an animator or CG artist. And as time goes on and you get better and you meet more people, you start to get more and more jobs that are in line with what you want to do. But you have to be patient during those years when you're developing your skills and be flexible enough to be willing to do commercials or I do a lot of title work. I did a lot of title work for Aquaman and a lot of other movies. That stuff I think is kind of fun. It's not as glamorous as doing the stuff in the movie. But then again, if you've seen Aquaman, I don't know. <laughs> I won't go too far into that. My opinion of the film is a fine film. I like Jason Momoa. Um, is that is that sort of an answer to your question? Yeah, I think that oh. helps put into perspective for sure. Yeah. Uh, yeah, Newt Studio. I saw their presentation at the Z Summit. <laughs> they do great work. Um, they do a lot of molecular and cellular stuff. They have one artist who's really, and I'm sorry, I can't remember his name, but uh, you can look him up. He's uh, um, he's he's a really cool guy, and he he does amazing, amazing work. But if you look at his portfolio, he does do. Uh, he does a, he does scientific stuff and he does non scientific stuff too. So you know, um, you know, don't be a, cast a wide net. A, a, and like I said, generalize and specialize at the same time. It's a contradiction, but most things in life are contradictions. You can learn a lot of stuff uh, from from nature. Um, the one thing that you know, the real driving force of a lot of people think in evolution is about the strongest surviving. That's not true. Evolution is about those organisms that can adapt the quickest. So that's the lesson you want to take from nature and apply it to your career. Adapt quickly, build up a strong foundation of skills, build up some interests, and let people know what you're good at and what you like to do. Uh, some great advice that I've heard from other artists, you know, don't put stuff on your reel that you don't want to do. Um, if you're not interested in doing Batmobiles, don't put a Batmobile on your, re your reel. Uh, because when people see what's on your reel, that's what they're going to hire you for, right? Um, the people who do the hiring are usually not the artists. They're usually the producers or the other people who work at the studio who work with the artists. They're not necessarily CG art experts themselves. So when they say, I need someone to model a dog, they're going to look at for people who have dogs on their reel, right? Who are really good at doing dogs. It makes sense. Um, and that's who they're going to contact first. Um, the other thing, and now I'm going to, again, here's another contradiction that's going to drive you all crazy. And I apologize, but this is how the universe works. Try not to do so much stuff that just looks like you want a job in the industry. You know what I mean? Um, I see a lot of uh, portfolios that just have like, you know, random guns or bullets or a doorknob or something like that. Uh, just to show somebody I made a doorknob or I made a gun, you know, again, it's like you want to show people who are doing the hiring, not just what you're good at, but also what you're passionate about. And if your portfolio just likes a whole bunch, looks like a whole bunch of stuff that is just designed to get a job in the industry, that's not as interesting to somebody who might be hiring. Does that make sense? Um, like I said, I got the bad robot job because people knew that I like bugs. 
Now I can't, I, I don't think I've met an artist in the industry who doesn't have uh, varied interests as well as varied, uh, at least one other creative outlet yeah. that might not be, you know, that some of that, you talked about some of those cross, those things that have cross currents earlier. Um, it definitely, I think, makes the voice that you have and the work that you do more interesting when you're influenced by, you know, again, bug photography, modeling bugs, or you'd mentioned that you play music as well. Yeah, I mean, I uh, I majored in <laughs> in classical guitar, of all things. Um, so I learned a lot from, from studying music and that kind of stuff that I apply to CG all the time. Uh, I don't play classical guitar as much. I play, I, I still write music, but it's it's really weird music, so. <laughs> So I like to give. Um, I'm really into like late '70s German space rock these days. That's that, and like uh, you know the tiki lounge music from the '60s. I'm trying to find a way to com combine Martin Denny with like uh, Captain Beefheart. That's the kind of music that I write. So <laughs> not going to make money doing that. Um, but you know, I learned a lot from practicing. You know, it's like there's a, a lot of interesting ideas. Uh, you know, there's a there's a the ten thousand hour thing, uh, the tipping point. I don't necessarily completely agree or disagree with that that point of view. Um, and now I'm trying to remember the names of the uh, audit. Um, <laughs> so there's a question about Tomas Wittelsbach. Did he do? I don't know if he did a Batmobile. No, I stole the Batmobile quote for actually from somebody who gave a lecture at Noman. I'm I'm stealing a line from somebody else, and I can't remember who it was. Um, it might have been Doug Chang, something like that. Um, uh, yeah, so I completely lost my chain of the train of thought there. Ask me another question. Yeah, no worries. Uh, there's a question about advice for the interview process when applying to an art position. If you can go, anytime you can go into an interview and they already know who you are before they talk to you, that's a huge advantage. Um, but that's kind of like saying it's easy to have a hit song once you're famous, which is true. Um, but to that end, um, the, the way to achieve that is to have a strong portfolio on a place like ArtStation. Uh, I know I plug ArtStation a lot, but I do like ArtStation. Um, or, you know, in the, in the communities, ZBrush Central is another good place. Um, that way, people have kind of are familiar with you before you go into the interview. I, I wrote a lot of books on Maya and ZBrush that, that sort of helps, although that's a really long and painful way to go about it. Um, you know, the, the other things about interviews is you don't want to bullshit. Sorry. You don't want to bull crap. Um, I have seen somebody in a studio try and fake their way through Maya and that was a lot of fun to watch. Uh, it was just like watching somebody be tortured because they they applied and got a job that they weren't qualified for. So a bunch of us Maya artists just stood behind the person and watched them fumble through Maya for a while. It was really painful. Um, the interview process is it's 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 really more about networking. Networking is what makes the interviews much easier. I haven't done a whole lot of interviews where I walked in cold and I didn't know anybody in the interview. It's been a long, long time since I've done that. Um, so I would say the secret to a good interviewing is networking. Um, I know that's really hard to hear when you're starting out, but this is one of the valuable things about schools, such as Noman. Um, Noman, is, 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 the, the great thing about Noman, and unfortunately it's hard to deal with in the age of COVID-19, but one of the best things about it is you're an environment when you're working with other people and those other students that you're in class with, you're going to know them for the rest of your career, uh, for good or for, for, for bad. The other important lesson that I learned from my days studying music is be very careful about who you diss. Be very, very careful about what you say online about other artists, because if you start ragging on somebody's art, even if you're right and that person sucks, be careful about saying that because you never know when you might be going through an interview and that person might be doing the interviewing. Um, I'm not saying that you necessarily need to kiss everybody else's butt, but I'm just saying, you know, it's very important to be cool. When you're younger and you're a bit cocky about your skills, 
there is a tendency to go and slag another artwork, artwork or directors or whatever and express your opinion. And that kind of stuff can really come back to bite you. Just ask the recent person who almost got a job as an editor at Vogue, Teen Vogue, about things that they say came back, coming back to haunt them. Be easy to work with. If your students and your teachers um, know that you work hard and you do a really good effort, that's something that is going to follow you for the rest of your career in, the, in, a, in a good way. But the opposite is also true. If you're a pain in the butt in class or you drive your teacher crazy, I remember the bad students. I remember the bad students more than I remember the good students. There are some names that if I see, because I know I'm just blathering on and on here, but um, like I said, I've worked at places where uh, a producer will come up with me a list of names and they're like, oh yeah, these people all, all went to Noman. Who's good here? And I'll pick out a few of them and say, this guy's great. That person's great. This person's wonderful. Avoid this person. Um, uh, I'm, I, I, I would love to plug my friend uh, uh, Shane Chambers, who is one of my students at Noman. He took a, my creature design class. Um, we hired him on the planetarium show and he's awesome. He is, uh, uh, he was too good. I started to not like him after a while cause he was showing me up. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> he's a really, really good artist and they were very ha happy to hire him. And he's a good example of someone who I enjoy teaching in my class, who I also enjoy end up working with. We became peers, you know? Uh, do I have any planner reference for a bug? Uh, I'm not sure what you mean by that. Um, in terms of like uh, 2D images that I use for, uh, yeah, I'm not sure. Yeah, they came. They came back and said that they they're talking about basically any bug you're sculpting. Usually, uh, you're, I think you're only as good as your reference. So what I generally do, like I say, the lowest, like the low hanging fruit is a Google image search. So if I could find illustrations, because 3D or photographs can be misleading. So I'll get as many photographs as I can. Then I'll try and find as many diagrams as I can. If I can't find that, then next thing I'll do is I'll go to books. So there are things called, um, let's see if I can grab one here real quick. Here's a good example. Um, so entomologists use what are known as keys. This is a very old school way of identifying bugs. Here's a key, whoops, <laughs> the right place here. Here's a key on spiders. What this means is that if an entomologist or arachnologist is in the field and they find a spider and they want to know what it is, they go through this. And the, the key is basically like a choose your own adventure. It's kind of like, well, does the calissery, do they look like this or do they look like this? Do they look like this? Go to page 430. All right, page 430, here's all your various spider parts, right? So they, they use it to identify spiders, but us as creature modelers and spider modelers, I mean, this is just like having all the diagrams that you need for modeling a tank or an airplane, right? So these are really good. So I'll use this. I'll hold this up here so you guys can see it. It's worth checking out. Um, so books are my second uh, place to go. Um, I will either scan or take pictures and I'll bring them into ZBrush and I'll put them on the grid or I use Spotlight a lot to just have the, the reference right there um, while I'm sculpting. And then if I can get um, a dead one from butterflies and things, I'll look at it under the microscope. So, but you know, like I say, you can keep doing this and as you get better and better at it, you know, you get better and better references, your bugs get better. But I usually rely on a wide variety of things. And then if I've gotten all of that and I'm still not satisfied, I'll find somebody who's an expert in that bug and I'll send the pictures of my model and say, say tell me what's wrong with it. So if, like for ants, you know, a lot of identifying features might be the number of teeth they have on their mandibles. Like, is this correct? Another, you know, ants have petioles, which is this structure between the thorax and the abdomen. Like a fire ant has two petioles, a carpenter ant has one. This shape uh, is a big part of the identifier. The abdomens might be different. So, you know, I'll have them critique my bugs and tell me what's right or what's wrong. I mean, sometimes the questions are like, like when I was doing the um, spider, uh, I did a Phidippus mustaceus for the Noman workshop video. And so I have a, uh, 
uh, a friend of mine, Ian, who is really good at um, jumping spiders and taking takes a lot of pictures of it. So he sent me a bunch of pictures of of his uh, of the Phytopus mustaceus female that he had. Um, and uh, I'll go off of that, and then I'll ask them if you know, because it's hard to find good reference for like the spinneret structure in a female Phytopus mustaceus to be completely different than Phytopus audax or something else. So that's usually where I go, and I just keep doing it until I get it right, or I give up and I'm sick of it. <laughs> you know? But uh, there's very few bugs I've actually gotten sick of. Uh, I really, I, I never get tired of them because. There's so many cool things about them. I mean, I'm showing you a few in, in, in ZBrush. I'm going to show you something else that's extremely nerdy. Um, I'm sure you guys will enjoy. So one of the hardest things to learn about bugs is taxonomy. So what I do is this is my hard drive, um, my file browser. So in here, I have a folder called taxonomy. And in that folder, I have a folder called Arthropoda. And in that folder, I have three other folders, Arachnida, Crustacea, and Hexapoda. In Hexapoda, I have two folders, one's Insecta and, and, and Dugnatha. So both of these are subcategories of Hexapoda, Hexapoda meaning six legs. Within Insecta, I have my orders folder, and I have a folder for every insect order. Now, most of these folders are empty because I haven't gotten around to modeling that. Please keep in mind there are 400,000 known species of beetles, so it's going to take me a while to get them all. Um, but if I go into like Coleoptera, these are where I have all my beetles, so I have my suborders. So what I do is I've organized my folder and you can get all this information from Wikipedia. So if you want to model like a bombardier, you look up bombardier on Wikipedia and then in the corner they'll have this whole thing listed out, right? So then I'll go in here and, and then what I do, just to be irritating to myself, is I don't create shortcuts, I force myself every time I need to work on this bug to go through the process of every single folder drilling down until I get where my actual models are. And by doing that repetition, very, very slowly, I start to learn the different orders, the genuses, the species, and that kind of stuff. So it's a way of forcing myself to learn taxonomy. Um, taxonomy is something that I certainly haven't mastered by a long shot. I know people that can rattle this stuff off when they're in the field, just pointing at things. Maybe they're making stuff up. I don't know. I think they're they're probably not though. Um, uh, but it's a great way to force yourself to learn this stuff. So there's there's little tricks you can learn for for helping to learn to learn to learn entomology. I mean, if I if I had to do it all over again, I would I would become an ecologist or an entomologist. But then I wouldn't get to do as much CG. So. <laughs> I like how you're basically just creating your own bug collection. Yeah, I know. And, and, and it now, all out and <laughs> I mean, it started out with four or five, but now I probably, I have a bunch that have yet, yet to be organized that I need to go and, and spend a day organizing, but I probably have 50 or 60 decent models. Um, okay, so there's a couple questions here, really good ones. Have you ever printed, 3D printed any of your bugs or lizards? Um, I have uh, sort of. So uh, this is uh, this is a made up bug that I did many many years ago back when I thought I could design bugs. Although I do like this guy, he's pretty cool. Uh, so a friend of mine printed this one up. I'm in the process now. I mean, there is like I say, the Australian job. They printed up a lot of my bugs, so those have actually been printed. Uh, but they're on the other side of the planet. Um, I do. I am in the process of learning more and more about 3D printing, and I will be printing some soon. One of the really exciting things that I'm doing right now is, um, since you asked, I love the opportunity to plug all my shit. Um, this is a ring that I modeled in ZBrush Core, by the way, and there's a free tutorial that you can watch. And this right now is actually being printed into a real 3D ring. So it's going to be produced in sterling silver. So that's really cool. I'm excited about that. My wife is going to get one. Um, the lizards are definitely on my to-do list, my wish list. I really want to print. I have a, um, a horny toad, which I really love. It's one of my favorite models. And I actually did it for a Nomen Workshop video series. 
where is it? It's down here somewhere. This guy right here. So this one I definitely want to print. Because I really like him. He's adorable. Um, and selling insect model packs is something I'm still debating because right now, like, I, I had to figure out how I want to do it because I don't want to give away everything. You know what I mean? Once you sell a digital model, it's out there. Um, so I want to make sure that I'm not giving away too much stuff. But probably at some point there will be. Um, I'll, I'll do something along those lines. I have had companies that have bought some of my models for specific projects before. Um, so I, I, you know, but I usually sort of customize it for them. Uh, I, and that's kind of cool because I'll, I'll have a model that I did like three or four years ago and somebody want to buy it. And I'll be like, yeah, sure, no problem. Um, yeah, cool. So uh, other questions? A quick uh, question about Oh, sorry. Um, Go ahead. Just wondering, because you've shown us your project you've been working with and a lot of the different, you know, bugs, assets, and things like that you've been creating. Um, and seems like sort of the latest deep dive has been into sort of the the eye systems. Um, yeah. What's on your bucket list of like stuff you you want to do in the future? Like if you were, you know, as you continue this video series, what's some of the stuff you want to uh, move towards? Well, I'm glad you asked. Uh, the next thing that I want to do is this damselfly model that I did for a ZBrush um, beta. Uh, my friend John Abbott, who is a dragon and damselfly expert, I asked him one day, I was like, what would be a really cool animation for you to teach entomology? And he said, one of the hardest things he has to teach is uh, mating between damselfly and dragonfly. Because it's really complex, but it's also really cool. They have a way of forming a little heart shape. You guys have probably seen pictures online. So I made this model. So my next one that I want to do is um, an animation that shows how these guys mate, guys and gals mate, a uh, life cycle thing. Uh, then I also want to do one, like I was describing the iridescence, and this is a good example because it's another iridescent insect. I want to do an animation that, that really does a deep dive in to how that occurs, both the physics and the biology, and also the evolutionary advantage. So um, I'm talking to Nathan Lord at uh, LSU. He's an expert in this, and so I'm gonna work with him on an animation series on that. Um, of course, one of the, the biggies is fireflies because uh, bioluminescence, I'd really like to talk about that, the various proteins involved and how it evolved, why it evolved. But the other cool thing, this is um, Photurus pensylvanicus. This is a really cool fireflies. We always love to think of fireflies as these sweet, adorable things. But look at this thing. It's got a buzzsaw on its face. <laughs> these, things are vicious. these are beetles, so they're coleoptera. And what, what this particular um, genus does is it actually eats other fireflies from other genuses. So some fireflies have evolved so that they can produce their own bioluminescent chemicals, right? This takes energy to do. Sometimes it's a lot easier to steal things from people than it is to produce your own. And Photurus has evolved so that it actually feeds on other fireflies and steals that ability, those phosphorescent um, uh, chemicals, or whatever. I had to get wow. it. So I love to animate that. This is something that I think somebody mentioned in a question before about doing a VR. I started doing kind of like a VR Unreal test in this. It's something I, I, I want to get back to because I'd really like to do. I'd really like to do more Unreal stuff because I, the rendering, even though Red, Redshift is really fast, it's still a big bottleneck, and I, I'd love to be able to churn out one animation a month. Uh, as opposed to right now, it still takes me several years to get, or at least a year or so, or several months, it's getting better, uh, to, to produce each chapter. If I could get it down to a month or a week, that would be fantastic, but I'm still a long way to doing that. But I think Unreal, the where where Unreal is going in the future, that's 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 how it's going to be possible for me to do this. And so the next thing I need to do is learn how to do lighting in Unreal better, as well as fur and fur systems and that kind of stuff. So that's kind of where, those are some of the topics I'd like to, but you know, I mean, 
spiders, you know, spiders produce silk, but so do silkworms. Is it this, how, how do these two extremely different organisms uh, evolve to have that ability? Is it the same thing? Are they the same genes? Are they different genes? Is it convergent evolution? Is it, you know, that kind of stuff fascinates me, mm -hmm. you know? Um, so spider silk, even just the process of how they produce it is, is really amazing. Yeah, I mean, it goes on and on. I mean, one of my favorite organisms is the amblypigid with, with these guys right here. Um, they're a type of arachnid or the tailless whip scorpion. I've actually had one of these crawl on me in a bug fair. They look like nightmare fodder, but they're actually quite sweet. They're not harmful at all to people. Um, but they're really, really cool looking. Wow. So yeah. I did an animation for Halloween of them carving a pumpkin. Um, just as a joke. I like to do goofy, stupid stuff. I like I like dumb jokes. I don't have kids, but I like dad jokes. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I, I did an animation of them carving a pumpkin um, was, uh, for Halloween. So this is a good example of taking the model and learning how to rig it and animate it and render mm -hmm. it. This is done in Redshift. Pumpkin is mega scans. I just did this in, in sculpting on here. So the leaves. Shout out to mega scans for making my life easier. Love those people. Uh, so, and the asset list just keeps growing and growing. Yeah. Uh, with mega scans. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, I, I hope they don't start doing bugs because they're going to put me out of business. But like I said, <laughs> it's going to take them a while. There's a lot of beetles out mm -hmm. there. Mm -hmm. um, on the we've got about, oh, I was just going to mention, we've got about another 10 minutes left sure. uh, for the stream. Just, just so you know if there's anything that you wanted to be able to touch on or, or get to before we wrap. Uh, I wanted to answer a question real quick about camel spider. Mm -hmm. I love them. It's on my to-do list. I really want to do it. I actually got just one of the bug shots. I spent time with a white box taking pictures of a camel spider, and they are scary. And they're very angry, and they always run right at you. Um, but they're cool looking. Um, so, yeah, I want to do that. Um, I, you know, it's an amazing time to be an artist. Uh, that's all I can say. The tools are very powerful. The one thing I, I would point, I would like to make, and I apologize because this is going to be a bit of a sermon, so I'll make it short, is we have we are at a point where we have these really powerful tools, and what I like, what I my hope for the industry and artists is to start thinking about how we can use the tools for something other than just entertainment. I love entertainment. I'm not knocking it. I love. I watched just watched all the Marvel movies in order. I loved them to death, but at the same time. I think that CG is a great way to solve problems. So obviously it's a great way to solve problems like sending spaceships to Mars and that kind of stuff or physics problems. But we have a lot of big problems in biology, in ecology. And I think that as if you have an interest in something that's gonna help solve a problem such as climate change and that kind of stuff, or even uh, pandemics, you know, think about how you can use your skills as an artist to help out the scientists who work in those fields because you have a very powerful voice and you can make this more engaging for the public. The public is not going to care about saving other species or the public is not going to try and um, save other species until they actually care about other species. And CG is one way that you can help people to care about it. So I have a basically a voice and the mission of my art is to celebrate biodiversity and educate people about biodiversity. I don't necessarily do gloom and doom animations about climate change and that kind of stuff. And rather what I do is I try and keep people interested and try and help out educators so that you can instill people an appreciation, something that's not so anthropocentric. So we start thinking about the rest of the world and how the rest of the world is going to survive. And that's what I use my art for. If you can find a way to do that, whatever it is that you care about, it doesn't necessarily have to be biodiversity or entomology, but if you have something you care about, care about, use your art to support that. Don't be so hyper-focused on just getting a job. You will get a job, trust me. If you're a good person and you do good work, it'll happen. You just have to be patient. You have to keep plugging away and be very patient and keep being determined. But in that entire process, don't lose sight of the fact that your art is powerful and with great power comes great responsibility, as a famous, famous Uncle Spider-Man would say, Uncle the Spider-Man. <laughs> so, so keep that in mind when you're doing your artwork. 
Absolutely. Well, what about where the what are your thoughts on where those two worlds collide? Like I'm thinking of some of the really cool uh, productions that have been coming out on Netflix where they're visualizing uh, things for nature or they're even visualizing what life could be like on other planets. Um, yeah, I mean, that stuff is really cool. Uh, I'm not going to. I have my preferences like I like BBC and I like Nat Geo. I have I have Attenborough going on all the time when I'm working. Um, I do like a lot of the Netflix stuff. I think they do a good job. I think Discovery is getting better. Discovery kind of irked me for a while because they were getting into, I mean, like I loved Mythbusters, but after a while Mythbusters turned into let's blow stuff up. And then, and as much as I enjoy watching Shark Week, sometimes I'm just like their science is a little, they stretch it a little bit too much sometimes. So I wish Discovery would get a little bit more rigorous, but at the same time, we all got to make money and, and it is entertainment. And it does tend to draw people in, you know. Um, I don't like the sensationalist stuff. Like I'm not really interested in doing stuff on murder hornets if it's just going to scare people about bugs. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, if, if, if somebody gave me like an unlimited budget to do a feature length film, I would do a feature length film on spider evolution or something mm. like that. You know what I mean? Like I would pick a topic like that and I would try, you know, it's kind of a tone thing. I think Netflix does a good job. Of it, you know, um, I'm, another good area of mushrooms are awesome. Mycology. That's such a cool, a cool field. Uh, there's so much to study in there. It's a whole branch of life that we don't know a whole lot about and has great amp applications. Um, for everything from medicine to, to literally textiles and stuff, you know. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, I mean, I, I, I guess that's sort of an answer to your question. <laughs> sure, yeah. And I think it's been really cool to see how I think the production value has slowly been, like, increasing, I think, in that type of programming. Um, oh, yeah. yeah. You know, I think there's more, more and more quality CG artists that are finding their way into that. Uh, or maybe I don't know if it's the producers or directors know know who to look for for making that stuff or it's budgetary But it's been great to see, you know, I think that Increase because as you said, you know, I think the production value definitely helps to draw in Somebody who may not know anything about the subject matter Yeah, it's, it's getting a lot better too because I mean like I said like, you know There's a lot of crossover for the entertainment industry. So you do have mm -hmm. you know I mean freelance is a tough world, but at the same time it does allow you to have a diversity of projects, but it also allows a talent pool that has a diversity of skills. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So like I say, I worked on a planetarium show. You might think that, you know, in, in the past, a planetarium show might be staffed just by people who work in the planetarium. You know, three people learn some software and they throw this thing together with, you know, of course I'm in LA, so we have a talent pool right here. So for Signs of Life, they were able to do a mixture of, of industry people who worked on, you know, Black Panther or whatever, and um, and other films uh, with people who were astronomers and done space art, and then a few people like my friend Esteban who have done both, um, mm -hmm. or me who have done both, you know. Um, so that's a really cool thing, and it's kind of the avid, I mean, the gig economy has good and bad aspects to it. Um, we need to get, a, I think we're getting a little bit better about I don't know. It, from my point of view, it feels like you're getting a little bit better about treating the artists better, but I don't know. That's just my personal experience. There's there's plenty of nightmare stories out there as well. So, um, you know, if you're if you're working on a job and it sucks, and that will happen to you, don't get up and walk off. That's the worst thing you can do, uh, because then you leave your fellow artists in a lurch. And I've seen this happen, and, and I've seen it happen the day before something was due. It's a really traumatic thing to go through. If you work on a job that sucks, finish the job, exit on the best possible terms you can, and then just never work for those people again, um, if that helps. Mm, yeah. Well, Eric, I want to thank you again for your time, uh, for being here. This has been super fascinating. I know that I've learned a ton. Um, I think that you could easily even just give a talk to help <laughs> inspire designers to come up with, with new ideas or at least help them take a deep dive into um, you know areas of research they never thought possible, and I'm I'm certainly getting that today. Um, and thanks for I think also sharing and opening up other doors, right? Um, oh, as you said, yeah. it's not just entertainment; it, it, there's plenty of other avenues that these skills can go into. So this has been a great time. 
Oh, thank you very much. Uh, a few years ago, I did do a Noman anatomy lab on entomology, and I did it with Jerry Krzyzewski, mm -hmm. extremely talented creature artist. Um, and we also had some entomologists from Los Angeles Natural History Museum, Lisa Gonzalez, Emily Hartop. Um, it's online available, I believe, on YouTube or through Noman if you want to check it out. Um, it's it's a, it's a really cool, I think the whole video is there. So. Um, now, if anybody wants to keep following some of the work that you've been sharing, what would be like, say, you know, your art station um, and perhaps the website that you've been posting a lot of these uh, videos to? Uh, two main websites, my art station, uh, if you look for me on art station, Eric Keller, but my website is also Bluepatone, um, bluepatone.com. Uh, I'm on Instagram at bluepatone01. Uh, the website is Entomology Animated and where are they here? Entomology Animated, so check that out. Um, we, there is an Entomology Animated Twitter that uh, Andrew takes care of. I'm currently not on Facebook. I kind of had to wean myself off of I'm taking a Facebook break for a while. Uh, <laughs> so mostly Instagram and um, also the uh, Entomology Animated and BlueCodone.com. And I'm always in contact with the good folks at the Noman School and the Noman Workshop. Of course, I have a lot of stuff in Noman Workshop. So uh, Noman has been a huge part of my career, so I can't help but uh, thank you all for letting me talk. And I'm, I can't wait to see the more stuff that we do in the future. And, and as always, thanks to Alex Alvarez for making those VHS tapes way back in the day. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. It's, yeah. I can't, I, there's so many people I've talked to that were like, it came down to a tape or a, v, or a, or mm -hmm. a DVD, and then the rest was just this rabbit hole, like going deeper and deeper. No, that's um, amazing. Into, yeah, absolutely. Um, well, again, thank you, Eric. It's been awesome just to get to chat with you as well. Cool. Um, I appreciate talking to you as well. Yeah, and I want to say to the chat, um, Noman will be streaming again uh, coming up on Wednesday. Uh, you can go and pay attention to us on social media. Our Chief Creative Officer, Josh Herman, as well as Alex Alvarez, have been teaming up with other artists and having some art jams together, working on some really cool stuff. Uh, and it's just kind of an art hang where you can watch watch these artists work. You can work on your own stuff in tandem. You can ask questions in the chat. It's really great. Uh, they, lately, they've been streaming in the afternoons from about two to five, but you can definitely check us out on our social feeds to uh, learn about upcoming events like that one. And we'd love to see you back here again on Wednesday. Um, so with that, everybody, give a shout out to Eric in the chat. Share your thanks uh, for him being with us. And I want to say Hope to see you back here again and uh, stay safe with everybody. And we look forward to, uh, I don't know, getting all of this back together again uh, as we start to to crawl out of quarantine. So, yeah. And see Josh Herman's one of my favorite modelers, too. <laughs> Josh is awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely check out that stream. You're getting like a lot of really cool people in one place. All, all right. right. All right, man. Take it easy. All right. Thanks,